Welcome to City Church's On Demand Messages. My name's Josh and I'm the pastor here and we are so thankful that you're tuning in. Wherever you're tuning in from, whenever you're watching this, in fact, if it's your first time, we would love for you to text NEW to the number on the screen right now. We've got a free gift for you and we would love to connect with you. Also, if you need prayer or if you wanna invest financially into the mission of City Church to be a Jesus movement that awakens the soul in the city of Griffin, you can text NEXT to the number on the screen um, and someone will connect with you and that'll help you take your next step there. We're in a series called The Beautiful Mind where we are looking at the topic of mental health and how we can help those that are struggling with mental health take steps towards healing and what the church's response, and more importantly, God's response to those who are wrestling with mental health is. And so if we can help you or serve you in any way, please connect with us. Text next to the number on the screen or message us, and we would love to serve you in any way possible. Enjoy this week's message. All right, so let's jump in this morning to our second week of The Beautiful Mind which where we are talking about, we have been talking about last week, we talked about it, and we'll kind of review if you were not here and get you caught up to speed, but um, we are talking about the uh, topic of mental health, something that we don't talk about a lot. In fact, a very wise um, theologian said this, the mind can descend far lower than the body, for in it there are bottomless pits. The flesh can bear only a certain number of wounds and no more, but the soul can bleed in 10,000 ways and die over and over again each hour incredibly enlightening and hopeful, right? I mean, but it's pretty amazing if you think about it, that our mind is created in such a way where it can even do that. Now, when it does that, it's incredibly painful as well. But can we just, I, 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 and I know this may be unfair, but can we just take a step out of the pain and just actually just realize that the capacity and the complexities of our brain, of our, of our minds, and how it, it does that. Now, the, the, the sad and the harsh part is that, that our, our bodies have a capacity to which they can feel pain, but the mind can continue to go into depths and more depths and more depths and more depths and depths and cycles and feel and feel and feel in different ways. I mean, this is the complexity, the beautiful part of our mind, but also the, the really difficult part of our mind. So last week, we just talked about and looked at a lot of statistics, very, very sad statistics, that in 2019, they made the... the um, they made the call, they said that depression would be the, the leading cause of um, in mental health and also death in 2020, and that was pre-COVID. They, they continued to go on and they said only 41% of people um, who have mental health, struggle with mental health, have received any kind of help. 41% of people that wrestle with mental health in any capacity, struggle in any way, have received help in the last year, which begs this question, the question that we're wrestling with and working through. Is why did the other 59% of people not feel comfortable enough to share that they were wrestling with something? Not feel comfortable enough to, 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 to share their struggles. Why the 59%? You would think that, well, the mental health statistics are only outside of the church, but the status for followers of Jesus are no different from people who don't. The struggles are real. And I think we have missed what we have missed is how deeply our emotional and mental health are connected with our spiritual health. So we, we, last week we looked and we just said the reality of why people don't feel comfortable sharing their mental health is because they come to a church and think you guys are supposed to people, be the supposed people that are admitting all your weaknesses more than anyone because we have a hope. Like we have something to say about that. And yet we're the ones that are furthest away from Jesus. So when someone comes to Jesus, they look around, they say, I don't see anybody else here. Because all, all the rest of us are trying not to admit our weaknesses. And we said that's the exact opposite of what God calls us into in the gospel. When we admit our weaknesses is where we find Jesus and his power resides inside of us. So with that, we believe that your mental health matters to God. If it matters to God, does it matter to you? The question today is, what are you willing to do about it? So last week, we just start with this very blanket question that we believe kind of starts us off and kind of informs a lot about us. And the question is simply this, how are you? Now, I was on a date with my wife on Monday. And we do, we're doing day dates right now because we have like a little window and I never thought I'd be the guy that, was, you know, day dates are for older people and now I'm doing day dates. And so here we are. So we're at lunch and my wife says, um, that's probably not true. If anyone was offended, I'm incredibly sorry. But, you know, uh, <laughs> I just thought that. So we're at lunch and, my, and Lauren looks at me and says, how are you? I said, I'm good. And she said, you did it. You did it. You responded the way you're not supposed to. And I said, listen here, woman, you don't talk to the pastor like that. And I, I actually did say that, and that went amazingly well. No, we, we laughed about it, but it's true. She called me out on it. We said last week, the way that the majority of us answer that question is, I'm good, I'm fine. 
maybe, maybe I'm okay, but I'm good. I mean, many of you walked in this morning and asked that, asked that question. Maybe you said, you don't know anybody's name in here, but you're like, because we forget names so easily. We're like, hey, pal. Hey, champ, how are you doing? And we probably responded with, hey, I'm good, without even registering how we actually feel. I did it that day, and she called me out on it, and we had a great conversation around it, but this is what we, this is what we do. And so last week, we kind of ended with, what if we just started with a simple step and just admitted, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. There's things going on in my life, physically, mentally, spiritually. I'm not okay. So maybe then we could begin to tackle some of the issues with people who struggle with mental health, because what we normally do is someone who feels a certain way, they suppress it, into where it just it builds up and builds up and builds up and depression and then something happens and they explode, right? And then, we, we, we're never around before that, but then when it explodes and something bad happens, we point our finger and say, that was mental health, I've seen that before, that was depression, that's anxiety, that's an eating disorder, that's an addiction right there. The question isn't, where were you when they exploded? The question is, where were we when they first felt it? Where were we when the first time they felt that something was off? The insecurity, the sadness, the anger, where were we then? Most of us were around, but that person didn't feel comfortable enough to share it. We don't need to talk about what happens when, we ex- when everything explodes, because we've seen that happen. But the question is, where are we when they first feel it? Do they know that, hey, when you feel something, you can come to me? So if someone walks through the door right now and has a broken leg, we're very, it's very easy for us to say, oh, we know how to handle that. Let's remove a chair. Let's get them a, let's get them a crutch. Let's help them out or whatever. When someone walks in and says, I'm struggling with bipolar disorder, a lot harder pill for us to swallow, and we don't know what to do with it. So how do we get to the place where we say, the first time you feel it, you can come to me. Feel. Feelings. Very complex word. See, feelings are sparked by emotions that are created by the mind and shaped by personal experiences, beliefs, memories, and thoughts linked to the, that particular emotion. Feelings are the most, one of the most complex and confusing parts of life and relationships. You know this. If you're married and you look at your spouse, you're like, I don't know what you're feeling right now. What's happening? In fact, I found this. This is called the feelings wheel. This is 78 different emotions and feelings that we can feel at some point. What I love about this is it actually kind of tracks it down. So they call it the six core feelings, sad, mad, scared, joyful, powerful, peaceful. So we take it from here and it just kind of, comes down to here. I, I really like that. But even to look at this, most of you are over, like you're like, I'll tell you what I feel right now. I am overwhelmed. That is way too many words on the screen. I don't know what to do with this right now. But to, even to look at that, we would say, and we can see why feelings are so complex. And it's no wonder why they're so confusing. So when we see this, we realize that it's difficult to handle and deal with our feelings. And so many of us develop patterns. We either fight them or we flight, fight or flight, so we just avoid them with all we can do. We freeze. We don't know what to do, and so we just stop dead in our tracks. But because we feel uncomfortable, we try to do one of these things. But there's another one that many of us try to do. We don't fight or flight or freeze. We actually try to fix. And we as human beings believe that we can fix feelings. I'll prove it to you. When, some, when one of your friends is sad, what do you do? You try to cheer them up. When one of them's angry, especially if it's at you, you try to make them happier. We do this all the time, but normally how we try to fix our own feelings is we suppress them, and so many of our mental health, is, so much of our mental health is put in jeopardy, not because of the feelings themselves, it's because of our choice to suppress them, but what happens is when we suppress them, we either try to deny them, I don't feel that way, I'm good, or we stuff it down, but stuffing it down is like a beach ball. Great toss, bro. I don't know if you've ever taken a beach ball in a pool. I thought about doing that in the baptismal, but couldn't see it. You ever try to shove a beach ball down in a pool and then raise your hand up to hope that it comes back to your hand? It never does. It just goes boo, 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 and raises up somewhere else, right? This is what happens when we try to suppress our feelings. We can shove them down all we want, but they'll pop up somewhere else. You, 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 try, to sh- you try to shove down anger or being overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed right now, which means I'm anxious, which means there's actually fear in me. I'm scared. So we shove it down right here, but then it pops up somewhere else. This is what we do in life. It's like shoving down a beach ball into a pool. It will always pop up somewhere else. So the question is, and how do we fix it? 
And not necessarily even, a uh, question I want to look at is not necessarily how we fix the feelings that we feel. How do we get into a rhythm where we don't feel that way anymore? I'll tell you what Google would say. Two words. If you're trying to fit marijuana into two words, it doesn't work, okay? How do we handle our feelings? Only two laughs? Wow. Okay, you guys are trying to be holier than you actually are. All right, so, um, <coughs> no, this is how we do it. Uh, if you Google, how do, I, how do I fix my feelings? How do I handle my feelings? How do I grow from my feelings? I'll give you two words. Self-care. Self-care. It's grown. It's a multi-billion dollar industry now. In fact, on social media, it's hashtagged 28 million times. I'm going to go outside and have a glass of wine on, on my table and read, read a book. Self-care. I'm going to go to the tanning bed. Self-care. I'm going to go hide in my closet and uh, just scroll through my phone away from my kids. Self-care. Hashtag self-care. I mean, like, this is what we do. This is an incredible movement that so many people seem to care about. 28 million hashtags. $20 billion industry. With everyone else caring about self-care, then we have to ask the question, does God care about self-care? Does God actually do it? Now, if you go around the room to Christians, they would probably tell you many different things. Some people are like, yeah, I'm all about this. Others would say no, because some, some Christians believe, and many Christians believe, that self-care is self-indulgence. They would say that the message of the Bible is self-sacrifice and put, to put others in front of myself, and they aren't wrong. It's 100%. I completely agree with them. The problem is that we live in a no-gray society and culture, so it's either one thing or another. And so you would say, well, if, if, if it's self-care, then I just indulge in myself, then I can't indulge or I can't serve and love other people. And other people would say, well, if you love, serve, and love other people, then you have no space to care for yourself. Well, what if it's, what if it's both? See, I, one thing I do love about the self-care movement is it, it pushes us and encourages us to try different things. So, like, if you Google self-care, they're gonna, it's going to say something like this. Here's what self-care is. Go watch a sunrise. Go hike in the woods. Go to the beach. Take a country drive. Watch the sunset. When all the dudes are like, this is ridiculous, right? But each of these is an effort to put in front of us something bigger than ourselves so that we would forget ourselves. I'm actually not opposed with the concept. I just think it's a little misguided. Let's see what Jesus has to say. Turn to Matthew um, chapter 22. Uh, it's going to be on the screen. Or you can turn your Bibles as well. Matthew chapter 22, just a little context. Jesus is on the scene. He's performing miracles. He's doing ministry. And the religious officials hate it, and so they're trying to figure out how to get around it. They're trying to figure out how to catch him, and so they come to him in verse 36 and say, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he responded, we read this last week, and he said to him, You shall love your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. So Jesus responds with something they know. You're called to love God with all you are, which we have to look at this from what it says all of who we are. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He would say in another passage, love the Lord with all your strength as well. It's a holistic body. We are both body and soul. And what God calls us to is to love him with all that we have. And so what the enemy wants to do is the enemy wants to separate and divide and distort in any way it can. So if he can't come after your heart, then he'll come after your mind. If he can't come after your mind, then he'll come after your body in pain. That's his job. It's to distort what God says is the most important thing. So God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all of you. As human beings, we are both body and soul. And to thrive, both need to be nourished and cared for. When we separate this idea of caring for ourself and then caring for our soul, we go to one or two directions. Caring for our soul without caring for ourselves treats the body or even the personality as a shell that houses the more important part of ourselves. It misses the reality of the brokenness in this world and the real ways it affects our body. Too much emphasis on self-care, though, makes our ultimate happiness our, about our physical needs being met. We know from Scripture that physical sacrifice is a part of following Jesus. Luke 9, 23, and he said to all, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. So we see here that there's this tension. I'm called to love God with all I have. I'm called to deny myself, and yet somehow... What do I do with myself? How do I handle that? Which I think Jesus brings us into in verse 39. And, as a, and the second is like it. So love the Lord your God, but the second one is like the first one. You shall love your neighbor. This is the command. 
You shall love your neighbor. Now, Jesus continues to dissect this, and he says, if you want to define who your neighbor is, I'm going to go and tell you. I'm going to wipe all the boundaries off of that. Your neighbor is anyone who is in need in whatever time. He's not the person that lives beside you. It's not the person that listens to the same music as you do. It's anyone and everyone. If they're in need, that is your neighbor. Then he goes on and says two words, as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Everything depends on these. So he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So that word, as, I have to make sure I say as, is called a presumptive presupposition. It's the assumption that is, the assumption is always and already true. So Jesus, as he says, as yourself, is already assuming that you are caring for yourself. And this is what he means by that. He says the two ways. First way, he says, I just, I'm going to go ahead and assume, and I know that you are a human being. And so you are created to care for yourself. We, we get that. I know that you're going to, like, self-preservation is built into our DNA. And so I know you're going to do that. And so first off, I want you to know to take the same level of your self-seeking and move it to your self-serving. But I'm also going to acknowledge your self-seeking. You see, how we actually care for ourselves sets us up to how we can care for our neighbors. The commandment is to love others. I'm not commanding you to love yourself. But the commandment is to love others with the understanding that you are already taking care of yourself. The reason that you are caring for yourself is not for yourself, though. It's not what the world would call self-care. It is so you can fulfill the commandment of loving others. So loving others is directly connected to caring for yourself. And the point of it is for the sake of others. I mean, you look at the rhythms of Jesus' life with his disciples. Regular, ordinary people. Mark 6, 30, the apostles returned to Jesus after doing ministry and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. They went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. One author put this, self-care is not a selfish act. It can be good stewardship. Like, so many of us, we're going, 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 going so much that you haven't had time to take inventory of your own self. And so you're actually not as good as you think you are to others right now. Second uh, Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Being in Christ clarifies the direction of our care toward nurturing his holy image instead of nurturing our old mangled self. We are created in the image of God. When we accept Jesus, we are new creations. And so now God is refocusing it. We see in the life of Jesus, in the middle of his ministry, Luke 15, 16, Luke 5, 16, Jesus often withdrew. He would withdraw to desolate places and pray. We see this rhythm in Jesus' life, and, and he encourages his disciples' life. There are moments we need to pull away and need to rest. Because if you aren't, healthy, then you're not going to be able to serve to your full capacity. If I'm not healthy, I cannot care for the ones that I love the most. I can't be a good husband, father, friend, or the pastor I want to be if I am not in a healthy place. This past week, I went to the doctor, and I have a high blood pressure, and I know why. It's because of stress. It's also because I'm not eating well. I'm eating like crap. It's awful. I'm not getting enough rest. If I want to be a good dad and a good husband and a good friend and a good pastor, I have to look at myself as what God has entrusted to me, which is my body, and steward that well. Not for myself, but for others. I want to say this, and just the Lord laid on my heart last night, and so I put a note here, and I said, if I feel this, I'm going to say it. Some of you may leave the church after this, and I'm good with that. But, and this is directly to men. Maybe women too, but just to men right now. And I'll tell you why in a second. But some of you are drinking way too much alcohol. You're drinking way too much. And this comes from, a, from a, a man who has a long history of addiction and alcoholism in my family. So I, I know it and I get it. You're drinking way too much. And what you're doing right now is you're numbing whatever insecurity and whatever pain that you've got. You're just shoving it down, shoving it down, shoving it down. And what's happening is, I mean, physiologically what's happening is you keep drinking and drinking and drinking and it's, it's doing harm on your body first and foremost. But more important than that, if the command is to love others as you love yourself, if you're not in a good frame of mind, and you're just drinking and getting drunk all the time, you're not going to be able to care and serve and love your family. I, I say this because I'm for you, but I'm going to say it, because we probably don't say it enough from stage. And there may be, there's probably women that are wrestling with the same thing right now, so I'm saying to you, but I'm just saying it as a guy, 
as someone who's called biblically, you are called to lead your family, you're drinking too much. You're drinking too much. Understanding this idea helps us join two things together. We are both body and soul. And for the greater good of serving those under our care, you're a soul and a body, so you don't need to get to neglect your body any more than you get to neglect your soul. So your body should be taken care of in order for you to both survive and thrive, but more importantly, to serve. So you need food, you need water, you need exercise, and you need sleep. I try to get like a catchy way to kind of put all this together, what I feel like God is wanting from us and what he's calling us to, and like a memorable slogan, and I could come up with two words combined with a conjunction, so just don't worry about the conjunction, but I think this is God's heart for us. It's to be whole and holy. To be whole. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, your soul, your strength. And to be holy, to become more and more like Jesus. So self-care would say you just need to be whole. You just need to be a better version of yourself. What the Bible calls us to is, no, you need to become a better, you need to grow and you need to take care of yourself for God's glory to become more like him. This is the end goal. And so if you are not healthy by the decisions and the choices you are making, then we have to ask ourselves, do we actually care about bringing glory to God and becoming holy? If one of those is off, then both of them are off. And I know that there's, there's, there are things beyond just changing the routines and rhythms, and we're going to get to that in a second, those steps in a second. But I think for some of us, we just need to look, and the anxiety and the, 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 the depression and the worry and the fear and the things that have been controlling us and sending us down a hole, and we've been shoving down, it's been popping up in other places. Some of us actually just need to take a step back and look at the life of Jesus and what he calls us to and reevaluate our rhythms so that we can be whole and holy. Uh, about a month ago, my wife decided she wanted to start doing puzzles. I'm not a patient person. We're going to talk about patience next week. I'm not a patient person. So this is a 500-piece puzzle of feathers. And not just feathers, gold-foiled feathers. Thanks, Lauren. And so we started uh, putting together this puzzle a couple weeks ago. And, and, I, and I, I learned something. Like, you know, and Anybody like puzzles in here? Like, I'm a puzzle person. Yeah, okay, awesome, let's go. So there's people have different strategies when putting together a puzzle. Some people color code them. Uh, other people work on the outside edges and the corners. Yep, I'm getting some head, shake, head nods. Okay, that's you. Some people just spend their entire time, and they're convinced that this is the one puzzle that the person forgot one piece, and you're like, you're the victim. How dare they do this to me, right? But here's one thing I know about puzzles. The goal of a puzzle is incredibly simple. Put the pieces together until it becomes a whole. See, none of these pieces make sense on their own, but they all matter because they create a masterpiece. They create a whole picture. They are all connected in every part and every piece matters. See, no one comes out of the box put together. I mean, this is the very, like we are born in with a sin nature. We are born into brokenness. No one comes out of the box put together. We all have work to do. And it's not complete until they come together and we are whole. Some of us today, the the idea of mental health, depression, it's real. I'm not discrediting that one bit. In fact, I I wanna say for you, I think one of the first steps of we, if this actually matters to us, and I think it does, we, you, had, you need to take a step. And for some of you, it's, it's beyond. We're going to talk about some rhythm things and some things to build into the rhythm of our life. But uh, for some of you, you need professional help. And I encourage that. In fact, I, I will tell you right now, text CARE to the number on the screen. We went through and created a a list of organizations in our community that work and serve people that are struggling with mental health and addiction. So if you text that, it's not going to sign you up for anything. It's not going to put you in here. It's literally going to send you a link to our website that has just a list of these things that you can find, that you can figure out, that you can take steps, and we'll help you navigate through that stuff. I would tell you, take that step. Nobody's, you're good. I was watching, we we had a couple of people in the first gathering take that step. 
I shared it last week, but I'll share it again because I, I just want to normalize this. Our staff is in counseling right now. Like part of it is for the first year of any staff member, we put them in couples counseling. But my wife and I, we went, we're back, we went back in it. Because just look at our lives and you're like, what's is everything about to explode? No. But I can be honest, over the last six months, I have felt feelings that I knew were not okay and made me uncomfortable. I felt anxiety and I felt stress and I felt fear and all those things. And so instead of just suppressing those and then them exploding one day, just let's go ahead and name them and let's take steps towards healing in them. Let's text care to the number on the screen right now. Take that step right now. For others of us, I think we have to, we have to look at the rhythms of our life and ask, are they, are they leading to making us whole and holy? So I, I actually want to tell you what this is not. I'll tell you what self-care through the lens of the gospel is not. <laughs> it's not me time or treat yourself, okay? Um, it's a very big phrase right now. So it's not just I need to get away from the kids. I'm going to close myself in the closet and just scroll through my phone with a glass of wine. Like that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about binge watching your favorite shows, which I love to do. I'm not talking about numbing out on social media, just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, just numbing out and suppressing everything that you're feeling. This was hard for me, but I'm not talking about eating a whole pack of double stuffed Oreos. Again, it's holistic. It's not good. I'm not talking about isolating yourself from others. I'm not talking about drinking your way through your depression and numbing out on that. You and I would both agree, because I've tried some of these things. They feel good in the moment, but in the end, it makes things worse. Because in the end, you're not the kind of person, you're not the kind of father, mother, coworker, leader that God's called you to be because you're suppressing things that God wants to uproot and heal. But here's what they could be. And I think, again, some of these things are going to be very, like, very just surface level, it may sound like. But I think everything, if we're supposed to love God with all we are, then every facet of our lives are meant for his glory and the good of others. And so I think there's some of these we just need to reevaluate. The first one is seven to eight hours of sleep a day. Scientifically, if you operate on five to six hours, it is you are operating with the mentality of someone who is intoxicated. You're making decisions with someone who has a blood alcohol level. A 30 minute walk outside. And when you walk, notice the sun and then realize the creator of the sun. And when you walk, notice the amazing fall weather. Come on somebody, this weather, let's go. Yes, right? Now let's stop for a second. Who do you think did that? Who do you think is adjusting the knobs? Who's, who's got the ultimate thermostat? Like that's, there's a creator who did that. So let, take it one step further than the fall weather feels amazing and think about who did it. And if that guy can adjust the knobs and make things cooler for us, man, what can he do in my heart and my life? Eat healthy. And I'd encourage you to cook a healthy meal. Read a book versus just looking at a screen. And I would say the best book you could read is the Bible. It's the only book that's going to breathe, that's living and active. Like your romantic novels, sorry. Read the Bible. Don't look at a screen. Connect with trusted friends, friends who can call you out and say, you're not good, let's talk about it. Practice stillness with God. God created us to be and to do. So many of us just keep doing and doing and doing that we forget that we can just be. And before anything that you and I can do, we are sons and daughters of God. Practice the stillness of God. Sit, don't do anything, and just be. And the last thing I would say is get the help you need. I'm gonna put it on the screen again because I think it's that important. Text CARE to the number on the screen right now. I cannot stress that enough. I cannot normalize that enough. Text care to the number on the screen right now. And I would say this, if, if, that's, if that's you, let's talk afterwards. If you're here and when I told you to stop drinking, that resonated with you and it made you mad, whatever, let's talk afterwards. Someone came up to me after the first gathering and said, I really wanted to punch you at first. And now I'm just thankful that you said it. If that's you, let's talk. 
take those steps. I read this and I thought it was so good. The power of effective rhythms is not in the seclusion or the silence or the journal, but it is in whom you find in the habit. If you only find yourself, like self-care would say, then your weaknesses, failures, and stresses can only be amplified and perpetuated. But if you find more of God, you, found, you have found resources far beyond yourself to address your deepest, most desperate needs. Because the goal for us is to be whole and holy. God cares about your mental health. If it matters to you, what will you do about it? Let's pray. God, we thank you right now. We thank you for these moments. God, I thank you that um, in a season of COVID where everything is incredibly still uncertain, you have not moved, you have not changed, you have not budged off your throne. If anything today, God, we are reminded who is really in control and still in control. So God, I think right now in this moment, some of us just need to breathe that in and realize that. Right now, you're still in control. You're still good. You're still here. You're still God. You're still Father. You're still friend. You're still King. So God, what I'm asking that we would you would give us the courage and the strength to do it. We know you already have because your spirit lives inside of us. God, would you, in your great mercy and grace, would you give us the courage to take the steps we need to do today? And God, the beauty of this is I, I don't have to say anything. God, your spirit does it. And so you're doing it right now. Let us not avoid that or push that aside. In your name we pray.